The Jesus Generation by Billy Graham, 1971. Chapter 15, Getting It All Together. On every hand, we hear that the world is coming apart. The global village is about to disintegrate. New York is a city without glue. The human race is ripping open at the seams. Throughout this book, we have dealt with the divisive forces which are corrupting the human race. They augur the disintegration of civilization into bits and pieces, a civilization which man has tried to construct carefully during the last few thousand years. A well-informed congressman told me recently, our world is finished. I've given up. I'm just going to try to enjoy what time we have left. For some inexplicable reason, many of the Western world's leaders share this death wish. Looking ahead, young people want to know, who can get it all together? Who can bring togetherness? Universal peace and harmony. It is the old story of Humpty Dumpty. Is there anyone who can pick up the pieces and assemble them into a meaningful and beautiful whole? The answer is Jesus Christ. In Christ, all the building fitly framed together, wrote Paul to the Ephesians. As Jesus' followers, we are certain of the future. In 1 Thessalonians, we have this promise that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. As I look at the United Nations, at America, at Russia, China, Great Britain, or even the human race, I find little reason for hope. But my hope does not rest in the affairs of this world. It rests in Christ who is coming again. The Apostle Paul once said, If in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. He looked toward another life, and so do I. Concerning the future, there can be absolute certainty and assurance. When Jesus enters the human scene, we discover that togetherness and hope are things that happen immediately. Upon receiving him as Savior and Lord, we are together with him and have a certain hope concerning the future. When we meet in his name together with other like-minded believers, we are bonded together with each other, whether we are Americans or Russians, black or white, red or yellow Christians. Jesus Christ has put us all together. At some time in the future, then, these two dimensions of relationship, that is, with Christ and with each other, are going to be fused into one. We are going to be caught up together to be with Christ forever. In times of strain, distress, persecution, and suffering, this is our comfort. We are to look forward to that time when there will be no more separation or division, no more night, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more war, no more crime, no more temptation, and no more death. The return of Christ to get it all together is one of the most popular themes in the minds of today's youth. Whenever I visit a university campus, if there is a question period, this theme is almost always certain to arise. In the late 60s, the Gallup poll revealed that an overwhelming majority of Americans believed that Christ is coming back to earth again. And a majority of the clergymen believed it too. A few years ago, the Bible teaching about the second coming of Christ was thought of as doomsday preaching, but not anymore. It is the only ray of hope that shines as an ever-brightening beam in a darkening world. Once leaders felt that technology, science, and ethical education would enable man to work out his own human dilemmas without God and establish an ideal society no serious thinker believes that today. 
It is true that many people have some sense of security, but it is a false sense. They believe that man and his works are slowly and painfully making their way upward by their own strength and intelligence. Many who support this theory also claim to believe in the second coming of Christ, but they claim that this refers only to the day when man will have purified himself by his own means. They say man will come to recognize the futility of war, the stupidity of greed and selfish behavior, the uselessness of prejudice and intolerance. They say man will understand that he is his brother's keeper and must live according to the golden rule. This so-called theory of inevitable progress is a myth and nothing more. It is based on what man hopes is happening, not on what's really happening. When these logicians point to the fact that modern science is now making it possible for us to live longer than our ancestors, they overlook the proposition that death is still our ultimate destiny. At best, we have only been able to postpone it for a few years. Certain political leaders are dreaming and hoping that the East and the West can be brought together in a future world of brotherhood, and that we can take the best of the East and the best of the West and put it all together in a universal utopia. This too is a pipe dream. As always, human nature is the flaw. Experience tells us that greed, lust, and selfishness will continue to rear their ugly heads. The Bible teaches that a time of peace will eventually come, but the peace will be imposed by the Antichrist, by the coming of a world dictator. It will last but a short time, and then the world will enter a period in which the judgments of God fall upon the human race. This period will culminate in Armageddon, in a confrontation between the forces of good and the forces of evil, which could exterminate the human race. But God, the Bible teaches, will intervene to conclude our age. From one end to the other, the Bible teaches that our present epoch will end with God's judgment and the return of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. This does not mean the end of the world, it means the end of this age, the end of the domination of evil. Over and over again, the Bible emphasizes the return of Christ. In Isaiah 66, verse 15, we read that the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. In Jeremiah, we are told that at the Lord's coming, Jerusalem will be made the throne of his glory, and nations shall be gathered in representation. There will be a mighty disarmament conference in Jerusalem, far greater than any the world has ever seen in Washington, London, or Paris. Ezekiel tells of Jerusalem which is to be restored, a temple which is to be rebuilt, and a land which is to be reclaimed and filled with prosperity. Daniel saw Jesus in visions, coming as the judge and king of the earth. Habakkuk shows the king measuring the new kingdom with a measuring rod and all the hills bowing to him. Zephaniah gives us the new song that he will teach to Israel and describes the overthrow of the false Christ. Haggai tells of the shaking of all things and only the things of God remaining. The Old Testament is brimming with many other accounts of his second coming. In the New Testament, similar predictions are even more vivid. Matthew likens Christ to a bridegroom coming to receive his bride. Mark sees him as a householder going on a long journey and committing certain tasks to his servants until his return. To Luke, Jesus is a nobleman going to a far country to transact certain businesses and leaving his possessions with his servants that they may trade with them until he comes. John quotes Christ as saying, I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again and receive you unto myself. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells of the Lord's coming to awaken and raise the dead. 2 Corinthians describes the new house we shall have when this earthly house is dissolved. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul tells us to wait for God's Son from heaven. In 2 Thessalonians, he gives us the glorious picture of the Lord coming with his saints. John makes this great promise to all believers. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The entire book of Revelation is given over to the teaching of the second coming of Christ. The most glorious truth in all the world is the second coming of Christ. When minds are full of pessimism and gloom, when all seems lost, it represents the promise of a wonderful future. Many people wail, what is to become of us? Where are we drifting? To which the Bible gives a sure, straight answer, saying that the consummation of all things shall be the coming again of Christ and the rewards that await the elect of God. Yours is not the first generation of young people to inquire into the future in search of clues of what life will be like tomorrow. Before Christ was crucified, his disciples asked him, What events will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, Don't let anyone fool you. See Matthew 24. And with this he gave them a summary of events that would signal his return and the end of the world as we know it. Naming conditions that would prevail one day, he said that we are to watch and prepare. Reading them, one must be struck by their resemblance to what we see daily on our television screens and in our newspapers. They are the very events that are shattering our society and civilization, and they will continue to plague us without ceasing until he returns. What conditions does he mention? He named many signs. I can mention only a few. First, he said, For many will come, claiming to be the Messiah, and will lead many astray. When I was a teenager, a generation ago, I never heard of anyone having the impertinence to claim to be a Messiah. Today, such pretenders are commonplace. Khrushchev once described himself as the Christ of Russia. When our ping pong players came back from China, the thing that impressed them most was the fact that Mao Zedong was a messiah to 750 million citizens. Here in the West, it was once Timothy Leary or John Lennon or Che Guevara. Messiah counting is a preoccupation of our times. It will get worse, as many antichrists and messiahs become forerunners of the ultimate antichrist. Walter Lippmann and Arnold Toynbee are only two of the many who have been telling us that a world anarchy can be controlled only by a super ruler. One of Toynbee's most quoted predictions is, by making more and more lethal weapons and at the same time making the world more and more interdependent economically. Technology has brought mankind to such a degree of distress that we are ripe for the deifying of any Caesar who might succeed in giving the world unity and peace. The Bible describes this coming dictator in detail. Read the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians and the 13th chapter of Revelation. He will rule for only a short time. At first, he will bring peace and will be praised by all peoples. He will speak to the entire human race simultaneously. Before television and satellites in space, this could not happen. Jesus said that a second sign would be, Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled for all these things must come to pass. See Matthew 24, verse 6. 
it is estimated that 30 times more space is devoted by our major newspapers to wars and rumors of wars today than when I was a teenager. But Jesus predicted further that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 100 years ago, we usually had one nation fighting against another nation. World Wars I and II were fought by kingdoms against kingdoms. Today, when pundits write of World War III, they say that no section of the global village can escape. The Bible calls this final war by the name of Armageddon. It stands for a time when the whole world will be involved in a showdown that will focus in the Middle East. Before man exterminates himself, however, the Bible promises that the final phase of Christ's second coming will be consummated when he returns to establish his kingdom, that glorious place in time when the lion and the lamb can lie down together. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, but he added that man's own efforts at peacemaking would never succeed until his return as the true peacemaker. During our time, great demonstrations for peace have attracted 250,000 or more people. These events are not wrong. They display right desires. Peace is being emphasized in our times as never before. But Jesus taught that even the most conscientious efforts are bound to fail until the day he returns. The Apostle Paul wrote, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. Jesus declared that his return is essential, for it alone can prevent man's selfish quest for power from resulting in the annihilating of the whole human race. Said Jesus, It will be a time of great distress, such as has never been from the beginning of the world until now, and will never be again. If that time of troubles were not cut short, no living thing could survive but for the sake of God's chosen, it will be cut short. Christ is truly coming. Most people are aware of the thermonuclear weaponry stockpiled throughout the world today. Despite highly publicized bans on the making and use of armaments, all of us know that enough warheads are around to exterminate the race. They rove in the oceans aboard submarines. They sit in ready-to-trigger missile bases around the world. And now, space platforms are being constructed that will carry them overhead. I believe that these are some of the circumstances that Jesus said would bring distress of nations and would be the cause of men's hearts failing them for fear. Read these words of Peter the fisherman, who is neither a scholar nor a scientist, and reflect on what scientists are saying. The day of the Lord will come, predicted Peter. Amidst a great rushing sound, the elements will disintegrate in flames, and the earth, with all that is in it, will be laid bare. The Russian scientists claim that one of their H-bomb explosions generated heat two and a half times hotter than the center of the sun. Only in our generation has the realization of such a prediction as Peter's been possible. The third sign was that his coming would be preceded by terrible famines. With the world's population now approaching 4 billion, and with predictions that it will double during the next generation, though it has slowed down in America, biologists tell us that there is now no way for hungry have-not nations where the population explosion is out of hand, to be fed. Read William and Paul Paddock, or Julian Huxley. Read the writings of Stanford biologist Paul Ehrlich, or Ohio State's Bruce Griffing. They give the world a decade until famine is universal. They give us a generation and a half to find the means to survive if we are to endure as a race, wholly from the point of view of food. 
Note that Jesus spoke of famines developing in many places, but not universally. We have them now. 10,000 humans are starving to death each day, the experts say, which is as many deaths in five days as all the American soldiers who perished in Vietnam over the last 10 years. And this is happening despite huge food surpluses in some parts of our world. Do you believe that Christ is going to permit this terrible hunger to go on worsening? The Bible says that he will not. He will return to rectify matters. The fourth sign would be earthquakes in place after place. One newspaper over a two-year period recently reported an earthquake happening somewhere in the world on every day except four. To believers in Jesus, each of these is a reminder that Christ is coming soon. In 1970, when Peru experienced the greatest natural disaster in the history of South America, with some 48,000 persons losing their lives, we were reminded again that Christ is coming back. A professional seismologist has estimated that there has been more than a 2,000% increase in major earthquakes in the mid-20th century over the mid-15th. The fifth sign before his coming would be multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. I need not enlarge on our current epidemic of crime and violence, which has swelled to terrifying proportions. Compared to when I was a boy, we now live in reverse. The people are locked up in their homes at night and the criminals are outside on the loose. When I was young, the criminals were locked up and the people were free to move about. The time has passed for many cities. In a passage that is startling to many modern eyes, Paul described conditions that would introduce the return of Jesus. The final age of this world is to be a time of troubles. Men will love nothing but money and self. They will be arrogant, boastful, and abusive, with no respect for parents, no gratitude, no piety, no natural affection. They will be implacable in their hatreds, scandal mongers, intemperate and fierce, strangers to all goodness, traitors, adventurers, swollen with self-importance. They will be men who put pleasure in the place of God, men who preserve the outward form of religion, but are a standing denial of its reality. Wicked men and charlatans will make progress from bad to worse, deceiving and deceived. See 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and 13. Is this America today? It reads astonishingly like the report of a presidential commission describing the factors that corrupt and pervert our society. As the sixth sign, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. See the book of Luke, chapter 17, verses 26 and 27. Despite God's warnings, through Noah, people were so occupied with themselves and with their wickedness that they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. See Matthew 24, verse 39. I need not remind you that the world is on an immoral binge, such as what not was not known even in the days of Rome. We are offered every pleasure that man can enjoy, and we have abused every gift God ever gave us, including sex, until we no longer find joy and satisfaction in them. We are now trying every perversion to get kicks. This is human nature turned godless, and it is one of the signs of the end. The seventh sign, one that Bible scholars have looked upon as the most certain sign of all, has taken place within the lifetime of many college students. This sign is the return of the Jews to their ancient homeland. The modern state of Israel was established in May 1948. 
In June 1967, Jerusalem became a Jewish city for the first time since 586 BC. Jesus had predicted, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Dr. Wilbur Smith, the great Bible teacher, once told me, if you ever wake up some morning and find the Israeli armies have occupied old Jerusalem, you can know that the end is near. The eighth sign is the rise of Russia as a superpower. In the 38th and 39th chapters of Ezekiel, one can read some of the most fascinating passages in the entire Bible. Many Bible scholars believe that these chapters refer to a northern alliance headed by Russia that will appear at the end of the age. The ninth sign is the emergence of Japan and China and other nations of the Far East. An interesting passage in Revelation 16 verse 12 refers to the kings of the East. It indicates that a time will come when the Euphrates River will be dried up and the kings of the east will cross toward the west with forces numbering 200 million. The Euphrates River is mentioned in the Bible as existing at the time of the Garden of Eden. Such famous cities as ancient Babylon, Nippur, and Ur were later located along its banks. It was the eastern limit of the Roman Empire. It is generally considered to be the boundary between the East and the West. Many biblical scholars believe that when the kings of the East invade the West, the Battle of Armageddon will be near. All the above signs seem to be converging for the first time in history. Despite rumors of war and prophecies of disaster, we are not to lose heart. For Jesus said that when these things begin to occur, look up and lift up your heads because your deliverance is drawing near. This is good news. His words mean that we should look up now, for I believe that Christ will take all of us who have put our trust in him to heaven before the earth suffers the apocalyptic woes that are described in detail in the book of Revelation. After the great tribulation, during which judgment after judgment will pour down upon a human race, whose heart is getting harder and harder toward God. The Bible teaches that the armies of the world will be gathered at Armageddon. Then, as the human race is about to destroy itself in one final conflict, Jesus Christ will return and get it all together. For the Christian, all is not hopeless unless his affections are centered on the things of this world. If you have been living a life dedicated to God, laying up treasures in heaven, with your affection given to things above, then you have no cause for despair or discouragement. Christians may now be approaching our finest hour. After hearing a clergyman preach on the second coming of Christ, Queen Victoria once said, I wish he would come during my lifetime so that I could take my crown and lay it at his feet. What a moment to take the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other and watch the unfolding of the great drama of the ages. This is an exciting and thrilling time to be alive. I would not want to live in any other period. Jesus said, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24 verse 44 Are you ready to meet him if he should come today? In many places, the Bible advises us to be ready always. One can say that this is an appeal based on fear. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. See the book of Hebrews 11, verse 7. The word fear could be translated terrified. Noah was so terrified at the prospect of coming events that his fear drove him to build the ark. Surely we should be similarly moved. Not only are we to be ready, we are to intensify our work for Christ. 
Jesus said, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. See Matthew 24, verse 46. Some people believe that if Christ is really coming, why carry on? Why not quit work and watch? This was one of the problems to which Paul addressed himself when he wrote to the Thessalonians. Explaining some of the details of the last days, he urged them to get to work. The hope of the coming of Christ should make us work all the harder so that we shall not be ashamed before him at his coming. See 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. To the Christian, the return of Christ will be a glorious moment. To those outside of Christ, it will be the greatest of calamities, a tragic separation, an unbelievable disappointment. It will be hell. But to those who are ready, what a glorious consummation. In describing the future of Christians, the Apostle Paul once said, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 What are these wonders? We do not know. Our human capacity for understanding is too limited. At the close of the Bible, a reader encounters these words. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Please see the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 1. A new world is coming. Each time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That prayer will be answered. Heaven is described as a new creation in which we shall move in new bodies, possessed of new names, singing new songs, living in a new city, governed by a new form of government, and challenged by new prospects of eternity with social justice for all. The paradise that man lost will be regained, but it will be much more. It will be a new paradise, not the old one repaired, patched up and made over. When God says, Behold, I make all things new, the emphasis is on all things. One day we shall live in a brand new world. As I write the final words of this book, I recall hearing a song recently sung by Bobby Goldsboro. It epitomizes the new and wonderful things that is happening to young people all over the world. Its words present the best evidence I have discovered that many of today's youth are truly preparing themselves for tomorrow. It's time again for him to come back. Yes, Jesus is coming again. Yes, you can prepare to meet him. Yes, you can know positively that he will accept you. Centuries ago, the apostles greeted each other with the word Maranatha, which means the Lord is coming. How about you? How about you being ready to help him get it all together? Maranatha. Maranatha.